Yarid, the stable boy. The keep shared its grounds with the city barracks. It was occupied by dozens of men in arms who had returned from their patrols around the streets beyond the keep, each heading to their tents and the yard to enhance their skills in combat. There were guards, patrolmen, and the watchers that came down from the walls, each at each other's sides, clanging their wooden swords together and shooting arrows at men made of straw. They traded both jokes and food, enjoying the company they had to offer, smiling among the torches and fires that gave them warmth. There were squires too, young boys who were taught by their superiors how to block and lunge correctly. Among the friendly fights were sons of bannermen, as well as stable boys that tended to the horses being brought in through the gates. Yared watched from the walls, standing on his toes to peek over the battlements that were lined with purple banners, swaying in the morning wind. Beyond the outer wall of the grounds was the city. It brewed up its stenches from its squalor, turning the air bitter as it moved with the breeze. It would be his last day of being the only Usoro in the keep. His family were already travelling back south after the funeral of his grandmother. He had wondered if they may have missed him while they were gone, wishing he could have joined them on their journeys. He thought of the days before, remembering the storm he incited for the hundreds that watched from the crowd around the pits, recalling how they laughed and pointed his way with crude grins and giggles. The humiliation was still with him, brewing in the pit of his stomach like something rotten he had swallowed, spawning the spite he always turned to when the shame came to haunt him. Wymond had been avoiding him throughout the day. Yared was sure he would inform his family of his outburst, gutting him with a deeper wound of troubles. He knew the word would spread fast through the city too, the watchers of the tournament would spread it like a maddened fire through the streets, keeping the whispers alive for the days ahead, ready for them to fall on his father's ears upon their return to Hornhold. A few chuckles and grunts came from the grounds that sat in the shade at the foot of the wall. Yared stared down at the four boys that lunged at each other with wooden swords, striking the leather on their chests and sleeves with them, learning from one another. They were each around his age, boys of ten or twelve perhaps, though they stood taller than he did. They were among the mud and the lines of whetstones, standing ahead of a man that inspected the many arrowheads at his feet, squinting his wrinkled eyes as he did. The swordmaster, Sir Lorak. He trained Yarod's brother for a time. That was until half of his face had collapsed during a duel of redwood blades, turning his legs to a kind that would never stand on their own again without a cane's support. He would often pause between his studying mumbles to call out any foul play between the boys, swatting any that got near enough to reach as he scrunched his crooked nose. Yared knew his father would soon search for a new man to train the younger boys, including himself, when he could finally get his approval to join in with the sessions. He hoped for a man who could teach him how to be a beast with a blade, a man who would mould him into a fine fighter. Wooden swords had a greater appeal to him than being tutored ever could. He thought of his approaching lessons in literature and histories, wishing to escape them any way he could. A session of training with the other boys was the choice that he took with ease, already running across the top of the wall, seeking the stone steps that led down the muddy grounds of grunting men. His purple cloak trailed behind him. Sweeping up the dirt, he hurried across, once he stepped out into the area of soldiers who stood twice his height, bowing their heads when they caught sight of their lord's youngest son. He liked when they did that. Flaunting his prestige was something he reveled in doing with a smirk. Morning, my lord, some of them uttered, stopping in their rigid stances as they swatted the shoulders of their fellow men in arms, each bearing the colours of Usoro House on their chest plates. Others had spoken in mumbles that were far too quiet for Yared's ears, though their sniggering was something he watched with a fiery malice in his eyes, knowing they were speaking of the tournament and the story that came with it. Yared watched the archers, who shot their arrows into the straw men against the castle walls, hitting them in their circled centres where their hearts of hay were nesting, each being impaled by those that wished to improve their precision. Some men sharpened their blades, letting sparks fly over the mud as the iron met the stone, screeching between each stinging stroke. Others tended to their armour alongside their trusty squires, walking shirtless among the steel that they polished and braced, 
preparing their protection from the thieves and fighters that waited for them in the dreaded future. What remained were only the men who were boastful of their carelessness. They were drinking away their troubles as they sat on their unmoving asses, chuckling with their own indifferent kind around the bonfires that attracted the ones without worries or wit. The flames lured them closer, like moths in the night that were too stupid to know certain death when they faced it. Yared knew they would be the first to die on a field of brutal battle. They were too senseless in their drunken debates to even realize he had been walking by them, feeling the warmth of the fires for a short moment before turning away, refusing to be a foolish moth like them. He ignored their dull discussions about a woman's bouncy tits and the city brothels, heading for the boys he had watched from the battlements of the wall, knowing they held more sense in their youth than those men could ever carry. Yared gripped the handle of a wooden sword that poked out among the others. They each sat, waiting for a soldier's hand in a large barrel. His shoes dug deep into the mud beneath him. He pulled at the sword until its weight was his to carry, too heavy to be kept above the ground without his slender arms becoming strained. He heaved for a moment, noticing the many heads turn his way when the tip of his blunt weapon hit the ground with a splatter. He forced his expression to change in their sights, wearing a vaunted mask that would never stray from him. He dragged the sword, slitting the mud open like the belly of a fish as he marched over to the four boys ahead of Sir Lorak. He could hear the old man's hoarse voice spewing out lazy orders about how each of them stood, how they wielded their weapons during their short-lived duels and lunged like fools. It did not take long for the boys and their quarrelling tutor to catch sight of his presence and his purple cloak, each immediately stopping in their small battles and bowing their heads. Lord Yarid, Sir Lorik said, standing as best as he could to greet him. Something I can do for you, or have you come to watch? I've come to train, Yarid spoke loudly. The four boys gave each other odd looks. They were much taller than Yarid, each of them could carry their swords with ease. My lord, I would have to convene with your father first, like I've told you many times. My father isn't here, Yarid continued, still hopeful behind his eyes. You trained my brother when he was my age. It isn't fair that I've had to wait for so long already. I understand, the swordmaster said reluctantly. But your brother had grown taller than you at your age, my lord, and he had a great many other skills he'd mastered before training on these grounds. I can assure you that your father and I will discuss it upon his return. Yared tightened his lips, hearing only frivolous excuses from the old man's lips. I am the only you sorrow in Hornhold. That makes me your acting lord, and you have to do as I command. And my command is for you to let me train. There was a scent of sniggering from the boys, who were quick to wipe away their smiles, keeping their heads bowed as they stared at the ground. Sir Lorak had lost his speech for some time, thinking over the order he was given by such a small child. Lord Yarrod, I would advise that you consider my... You're not an advisor, Sir Lorak. You're the swordmaster, and it's your duty to train the sons of my father. So, train me, now. I could teach him some of the footwork, Sir Lorak, one of the blonde boys insisted, smiling at Yarrod while digging his wooden blade into the ground. It's simple enough, if it pleases you, my lord. That is very charitable of you, Willem, but Lord Yarrod can hardly lift his sword, Sir Lorak protested, slumping back down as his aching knees shuddered. He can use this one said the second boy, picking up one of the lighter ones that sat among the dirt. I don't want to learn footwork, Yarrod sulked, taking the smaller sword in his grasp. I want to learn how to fight. Footwork's the first part of learning to fight, the third sneered. He was one of the stable boys, free of his duties for a time, while his stables remained empty. How can a lord's son not know something so obvious? Dom, keep your words buckled, Sir Lorak ordered still looking displeased at the sight of the boys assisting Yarrod in his first go at sword training. I want none of you to touch the Lord at any time. You will not strike him or let harm come his way. Am I understood? The boys nodded and muttered at their swordmaster's words. All right, Will said, tucking back his blonde hair behind his ears. You have to prepare your stance first, my lord. Yarrod clutched tighter to his lighter sword and watched as the boy spread his feet ahead of him. Yarrod did the same as best he could, crouching slightly, 
shivering with all sorts of feelings and ready to gloat to his brother of how he trained on the grounds. What kind of stance is that? The stable boy added, chuckling at how Yarid stood. I told you to keep quiet, Tom, Sir Lorak hissed. But look at how he's standing. He's going to lose his balance. You're going to lose your head if you don't stop talking, idiot, Yarid spat, creasing his face together and showing his scorn. Tom faltered for a moment before he covered his grinning mouth, turning away as he chuckled into his palm. Yarid watched him from the corner of his eye for some time, soon turning back to the blonde boy, ready to begin. Start by putting your left foot further back, my lord, like this, they instructed, allowing him to mirror their stance. He soon had his arms raised to his chest, gripping his sword in his fingers with the wooden blade pointed forward. That's very good, my lord. And he moved his foot. You don't have to praise him for it, Will, Tom continued, speaking with the voice that Yarid was getting sick of hearing. And it's not as if having a good stance will help him anyway. He's no taller than a dwarf. Tom! Silorak yelled to him again as Yarid turned his way, lifting his weapon to the boy's jaw with gritted teeth. I'll have you executed for speaking of your lord that way, Yarid threatened, trying his best to look as menacing as he could. You're no lord, you're just a second son of one, Yarid boiled as he listened with tensing fists. When my father returns, he'll hang you from the gallows. When your father comes back, I'll tell him about how you cried at the tournament. He'll be disappointed in his crying little cowardly son. I was there, I saw all of it. I didn't cry, Yarid yelled throwing his sword forward to whack the boy's chest. Boys! Salorak called out with a strident voice, doing his best to stand. Tom ripped the sword from his grasp with ease, throwing it to the ground and shoving Yarid by his shoulders, letting him fall onto the dirt before he mounted him, pinning him down beneath his weight while his eyes flared. I'll gut you like a rabbit! Tom spat, alerting the attention of those that trained on the grounds, drawing in a small crowd of onlookers that watched the two of them. I'm a lord! Yarid screamed into the air as Tom shoved him deeper into the earth. You can't fight a lord! You're a scared little girl who can't even swing a sword right! Not a single soul had ever dared to lay their hands on Yarid, yet the boy on top of him stared down at his crumbling face with fire in his eyes a gaze that burned so hellishly that he thought he might actually kill him. Get off of me, he cried back, spotting Sir Lorak collapsing to his knees, too weak to intervene with the brawl. The other boys stared forward, blushing at the sight of their lord being humiliated by the one they trained with. Fear pierced him like a hundred knives as he watched the boy above him grimace, fighting him with his arms that were twisted and bent aside. Stop, Yared continued feeling his lips tremble in the eyes of so many, shaking his head as he felt the tears slipping from his eyes. Yield, Tom sniggered, pressing himself down heavier on his body, treading on his lungs with his knee, looking amused by his whimpers. You're hurting me! You have to stop! He went on, thrashing his arms and legs while his cheeks turned wet with indignity. You have to yield if you want me to let you go! Yarid shook with fright, feeling lungs being flattened by his relentless tormentor who chortled at the attention that surrounded him. At least, that was until his crude smile faded at the feeling of something soaking his leg. Tom's grasp loosened slightly as his face looked down at the knee he had at Yarid's thigh, soon looking disgusted by what he could feel, dampening his skin with a vile warmth. He's pissing on me, the stable boy yelled hurtling away from Yarid's trembling body that lay soaked on the ground and smelling of filth. The Lord pissed himself! Tom was both laughing and squirming at the sight, shaking his leg like a dog while calling the attention of everyone on the grounds, letting it be known that the Lord's son was truly lying in his own foulness. There were laughs and pointing fingers, as well as waving hands that summoned others to the growing circle that caved in around him. Their faces stood like a sealed tomb of shame. Tom, withdraw yourself from these grounds immediately, Salorak barked at him, catching his shallow breaths and returning to his wobbling feet. The boy did as he was told, surely keen to rid himself of Yarid's mess. Lord Yarid, stand up, boy, Salorak continued, speaking to him with an attempted softness in his tone. It is done now, let me take you back into the keep. Yarid was stiff unmoving from his open grave as his disgrace stood in plain sight. 
His tears still fell, falling into his ears to muffle the sounds of the deafening laughter that the swordmaster tried his best to dissolve. The humiliation was raw. It was yet another story for the people of his city to trade between them, one coming no less than a few days after his outburst in the pits. He crumbled like parchment in water, screaming at himself from within to stand up, to escape the utter hilarity every soul around him felt when their eyes fell onto the sight of his drenched thighs. Away with all of you, Salorak shouted to the hesitant crowd of amused onlookers. And someone, go find me a bloody guard. Yared fought the paralysis that plagued him with all of his dying might, twitching his hands until they could finally hoist him up, pushing himself from the dirt onto his weakened legs that could hardly help in his efforts. He stumbled along the grounds toward anywhere that would free him from the eyes and mockeries of the spectators behind him. Through an archway, and then another, he distanced himself from the sounds of laughter that would surely haunt him, trudging along the other courtyards of his keep and waving away the servants. His throat grew twice as thick, and his ribs felt as if they were going to collapse in his chest. Although the air was silent, he could still feel the shame following him like a spirit, refusing to let the cruel memory be pushed aside by anything else. He stumbled onward as if he had knives in his ankles, turning every step he took into a burden. It wasn't until he reached his mother's gardens that he finally lost his footing, collapsing ahead of the bed of roses, folding in on himself as he wept. He held his legs close to his chest, punching the cobbles until his knuckles turned bloody, loathing the tears that streamed from his, each one reminding him of how weak he truly was. He thought of Tom, looking down at him, and laughing, pulling the attention of dozens more men who bathed in his humiliation. The sight of him came to him with the glow of burning red through his tears. Yarid could not muster up a word to how he felt, or whether his body shook with fear, shame, or anger. His fist kept pounding the path he was curled up on, tearing his flesh and not helping to rid the endless wave of his weeping. The stable boy would surely be proud of himself, to be the one to embarrass Yarod so callously. It would be a story he would tell to those he met in the city when he returned to the streets, a story he would tell his children, perhaps with a gloating smile. There was a fire in his throat and his gaze, forcing him to stand back up to his silting feet. Yarod wanted to see the flames within him engulfing the boy he hated. He wished to hear their screams, or at the very least, to hear their pleads for forgiveness. His brother would surely tease him for what had happened. Yared knew he would not hear the end of it, condemned to a future filled with mockeries and reminders about how he lay in a puddle of his own piss, terrified like an infant. He wanted Tom punished. With his swollen fists, Yared stepped forward to face one of the many stone pillars that lined the gardens, each adorned in twisting flowers and thorns growing from the spiraling vines. He held tightly to one of them, shivering in his stance as he prepared himself for his own barbarity, one led by the thought of his newly acquired enemy paying for the humiliation he had caused him. With one quick lunge, Yared threw his head forward, smacking his nose hard against the stone before squealing at the pain. His skull burned like molten steel beneath his skin that was surely bleeding, yet he kept his grip tight, tensing his face and charging it forward again, much harder than before. He felt the trickle of his own blood down his brow, as well as from his nose, that throbbed from his own doing. His wounds were the beginning of bruises, and perhaps some subtle scars, ones he was already creating a tale behind, one that was spun to be harsh and dishonest, formed from his own morbid imagination. Yarid stared down into the reflection of the garden's shallow pond, content with the damage he and the pillar had caused. The pain came and went like the tides, striking him with aches and blurred vision as he wiped his head, pulling away bloody fingers that he rubbed all over himself. Convincing, enough at least to sway those who had served beneath him. Upon being satisfied with his own mutilations, Yared trudged forward, heading for a place he knew would greet him with open arms. He kept his head down through the paths of his home, avoiding the eyes of his servants, not wishing to tell his tale until he was in the company of those he sought. He was sure to make his story one for them to pity him for. 
Soon enough, his path followed the sweet smells of the kitchen that were undoubtedly brewing up pastries and tarts for him, preparing for the last dinner he would have alone before his family's return from the capital. He would swear to anyone that the kitchens of his home were the best in all of Eskimar. Yared eyed the cooks beyond the open door, each of them red-faced and bustling between each other like ducks as they carried their preparations for supper. They were each draped in white like swans, muttering to each other in quick sentences, determined to have a decent meal prepared before dusk had come. Yared broiled, not caring to think carefully about what he was about to do, or what would come of it. He simply crouched to the floor before slumping down on it, curling his arms around himself and tucking his head into his knees. And then he cried. He wept no tears, but he moaned and blubbered loud enough for those in the kitchens to hear him. The noises from his mouth came out raucously, summoning the many women from the warmth of the kitchens to hurry to his side. Lord Yarrit, one called out, holding a mother's gentle tongue. Gods, what happened to you? A younger girl caught sight of his bloody face. Gods, my lord, how did this happen? Should I fetch him anything? Another called out. Sir Wyman, girl, have him brought here at once. I will take him inside. Yared was guided by the woman's caressing arms that led him closer to the delicious smells she had been forging from the furnaces. Several other hands tended to his face that they each gawked at pausing in their efforts of food preparations and instead devoting themselves entirely to his aid. Cloth and water dabbed at his butchered cheeks. Kind voices spoke to him softly, asking of what had caused something so awful to happen. He pretended to be too dazed, perhaps too disturbed to be able to muster any words about it. Which boy, my lord? the woman stuffing his nose asked. Before they could spill an answer, Wyman had burst through the doors, shoving his way through the concerned girls until he was kneeling ahead of Yarid, eyeing him with a frightened gaze. What is this? he asked, turning to the many faces as if they were all his enemies. Who did such a thing to Lord Yarid's face? I want them brought here at this instant. He's not told us a name yet, Sir Wyman, the elder cook croaked. Yarid watched as Wyman returned to his gaze clutching at his wrists with a worry he wore on his expression. Speak the name, Lord Yared, he uttered. Yared looked around the room for a moment, pleased with all the eyes that were on him, as well as the care and concern that was thrown his way. He had no stage, yet he had an audience, and he wished to see to it that his act was prepared and at the ready. It was Tom, he scowled. I'd been training with him in the yard, and after I returned to the keep, he attacked me in the gardens. I hadn't seen him coming, and he wouldn't stop hitting me, and then he threatened me, told me he would gut me like a rabbit if I ever told anyone. Wyman watched him for some time, repeating everything he had said beneath his breath, piecing together his story with a cautious eye. Tom, he spoke, that is the stable boy in Sir Lorak's care, is he not? Yared nodded. I suppose the boy will still be on the grounds, Wyman continued standing to his feet once again and knotting his fingers, looking to the men at the door. Go and fetch him. Bring him here when he is found. We will clear this matter up as swiftly as we can. Two of the guards who had arrived at Wyman's shoulders had soon departed, heading for the courtyard of the keep with their purple cloaks following behind them. Yared watched as their shoulders faded, all the while chomping on one of the tarts the cooks had offered to him, coddling him like a newborn. I want this room cleared. Wyman announced. The eldest cook faltered for a moment. But tonight's supper, Sir Wyman. Never mind that now, he told her. This should not take long. You will occupy yourself until we are done here. No one will curse you or your girls for a late supper. Now go. The many girls soon fled from the room under his order, sentencing the air to silence within mere moments. Yared's blood had stained the white cloth's red, each pressed against his cheeks and nose until his wounds ceased their leakings, though still being terribly sore. Wyman dragged a chair to sit at Yared's side, tending to him with his own hands, continuing to stare deeply at him as he prodded his skin. Did you instigate it? he asked Yared, lifting his head to check up his nose. No, Yared murmured, because I know better than most that you are prone to your outbursts, 
Perhaps you might have said something to offend the boy before he did this. I didn't say anything to him, Yared protested, still with his voice slipping out in whispers. The eyes of Wymond weren't like the cook's. His gaze held suspicion, brewing with conspiracies that he considered over and over while the two of them waited. Your father was intent on not allowing you to train, they continued. I can only wonder how you ended up training with a sword in the yard, despite the wishes of Lord Usoro. I'm old enough, Yared hissed. Sir Lorak was teaching me. Again, another long silence had cursed them. The sight of Wyman's studying glare made Yared shift in his seat, scared of faltering the solemn mask he was wearing. You say the boy struck you? Wyman asked, snatching fresh cloth from the shelves that were soon smeared across his bloody face. Yes, he kept punching me and had his hands at my throat, and then he ran away like a coward. He needs to be punished. You have to make sure of it. What that boy needs is to firstly be questioned on the matter. Wyman spoke softly. I'm very intrigued to hear what he has to say. But he'll deny it. You can't believe him if he denies it, Yared pleaded. Keep composed, my lord Yared. What use would another sulk be to you? There is no need to tempt yourself with the malice you clutch so cleanly to. You and I will let the boy say his piece on the altercation you described, and, after he is done, I will decide what will occur after. But I am your lord, Yared retaliated. I make the decisions, and you have to obey them. You are also a child, my lord, one whose care was entrusted to myself before your family departed this city, and I intend to keep you from your own vengefulness. For now, I must prioritize the truth of whatever it is that has happened. I already told you the truth. Wyman nodded, with skepticism in his gaze. From what I understand, there were two young boys in that garden, as you have said, and they both have their own stories to tell on how your face has suffered in the way it has. You have told your story, and now I wait for the other. You may defend yourself as much as you wish, but any honorable lord would know when to hold their tongue. Yared ceased, thinking over all he had done, uncaring to the fate of Tom, but slowly dreading that of his own. Soon enough, the daunting sound of steel boots marching along the stone path beyond the kitchens neared closer tensing Yared's body as if he were choking on poison in his throat. Look me in the eye, my lord, Wyman whispered, calling Yared's flustered attention and staring at him for some time. Before I speak with this boy, I wish for you to swear to me that everything you told me of your quarrels with him are entirely true. For a time, all that could be heard were the footsteps that were soon to arrive. Yared looked everywhere but the man's stiff gaze wincing his mouth and trying his best to hurl out the words he was asked to speak. It was a tremulous task, one that he took his time with. I told you the truth, Yared uttered, looking at the man's brow instead of the eyes that sat below, hoping he would not notice. Before making him swear to his words, the guards had soon arrived, both bordering the boy between them who hesitated to bow his head. Tom looked over at Yared's reddened face, startled by how different it was from mere moments ago in the yard. My lord, the boy breathed, looking at the other faces in the room, confused and shaken. Look to me, boy, Wyman ordered, standing to his feet and strolling forward some paces. Lord Yared has come to me with something he wished to share, a trouble he has endured involving yourself. I wish for you to speak on the matter, if you could. Sir Lorak handled it, Sir Wyman, Tom said. I should not have shoved the Lord's son, I know that, but he did strike me first. Liar! Yared spat. Come now, Lord Yared, Wyman snapped back. I'm hearing the second story, and I wish for you to be quiet for its entirety. It's the truth, Tom continued. Sir Lorak was there when it happened, you may ask him, and the other boys were with us, Will, Chorus, Nice, and they will all tell you the same story, along with anyone else in the yard. I'm sure they would, boy. But I do not care for what happened in the yard. I wish to know what happened after, in the gardens, between yourself and Lord Yared. Tom froze for a moment, utterly perplexed. Forgive me, I have not been in the gardens, Sir Wyman. Are you certain? Because Lord Yared has made some claims that you were in fact in the gardens just some moments ago, right after the altercation in the yard as it happens. I was in the East Gate House cleaning my breeches. 
What reason would I have for walking in the gardens? Wyman's lip twitched slightly as he glanced back at Yarid, looking more suspecting than before. Lord Yarid said that you attacked him during one of his promenades, said you crept up behind him and struck him many times in his face. Tom remained speechless, wielding a face that looked between the two of them, both shocked and amused by such a tale. He's a liar. I am not, Yarid protested, tending to his stinging cheek. You are. I did not hit you, and I was nowhere near the gardens. As I said, I left for the East Gate House after he pissed all over me in the courtyard. Lies, Yarid barked. Did anyone witness you enter the gatehouse, boy? Wyman asked, knotting his hands together. So, Wymond, the East Gate House is not in use. It's the most quiet place on the grounds, which is why I went there. So your answer is no, Wyman dared, keeping his stance rigid as the boy faltered. Tom soon stepped around him, facing Yarrod with a brewing anger. You've stooped too low, my lord. You're an embarrassment to your family name, and you've brought them nothing but shame. Wyman reprised his place as the wall between them, not allowing their eyes to meet. Do you deny his claims? Tom broiled. I speak the truth. There's nothing more to say. Then how do you suppose Lord Yarrod came to be with these beatings on his face? Wyman asked sternly. I wasn't there. He probably did it to himself. He won't admit it, just like I told you. Yarrod hissed. You're a coward, Tom returned. I will tell my father of this, and yours will hear of it too. I intend to settle this matter without calling for anyone else's involvement. Wyman spoke, doing his best to tame the two boys that howled like wolves. There is not a single person who can validate you entering the gatehouse. Tom looked as if his hope was being slowly torn from his grasp. Nobody saw me, but I swear to the gods, I swear on the grave of my dead mother, I'm speaking truthfully. He needs to be punished, Yarid spat in his high voice. Wymond turned to him sharply. Enough, my lord. If you won't do it, my father will. Yarid continued with spit, looking to Tom again. He'll cut off one of your hands and put you in the cells. Yarid felt powerful as he spoke. He had guards all around him, and Tom could not prove a thing. Wyman looked down to him with a greyness in his gaze. It was a defeated expression, one riddled in both disappointment and disdain, as if the man had accepted the corner Yarid had pushed him against before seizing him entirely. An apology, then, Wyman uttered. No, Yarid yelled out. I want him to be punished. Wise and honourable men do not call for violence, Yarid. You will leave this alone, and you will accept the apology this boy gives you and set aside your enmities. I don't care about wise and honourable men. I am a you sorrow. You listen to me. They barked, scrunching their beaten face together even more, thirsting for blood. Or you won't be an advisor for much longer. I'll make sure my father sends you far from here. There was a flinch in the old man's wrist. Yarid almost missed it. He wondered if Wyman yearned to strike him, and part of him almost wished he had, so that he might call for more punishments from the guards that watched intently. On their face there was now only scorn. The air stood still as they each held their breaths. Wyman bit his tongue for a time. He stared at the ground and then to the walls, wrestling his curses and choices that clashed in his head. Very well. He spoke softly, slowly walking over to the two guards that stood with Tom. He moved his lips to their ears, letting out a whisper too quiet for Yarrod to heed. And then Wyman returned, taking his place behind Yarrod as the two guards grabbed Tom's shoulders, pulling out into the light of the gardens as he fought against their strength. Let me go, Tom hissed. Yarrod turned to the old man. What are they doing? Enough, Wyman let out sounding broken in his tone. Do not speak, Yarrod. Not to me. There came the muffled sounds of a struggle from beyond the door they stared at. Yarrod could make out the grunts and squeals to be Tom's. He listened as the guard's fists had landed, how the metal clashed with flesh so viciously, and how the boy's body collapsed to the hard floor many times between the beatings. It continued for a short while and each new sound that Tom made came more harrowing each time, until finally it stopped. There was a long breath of silence before the door opened again, letting the two guards march back inside with Tom's marred body between them 
dragging him on limp legs with his head bowed to the floor. Wymond had looked away, but Yarid stared only forward, watching as they lifted their head by their hair, looking at the blood that slid down his shirt from his back. His lips were bulging, and his one eye was filling with red, sitting among the skin that began to grow blackened and bruised. They had done some heinous things to him, it was very clear to see. Come now, boy, Wymond urged solemnly, still not ready to bear the task of looking them in the eye. Let us be done with it. Tom looked to him with teary eyes, and then to Yarrod, wearing resentment all over. I'm sorry, my lord, they said coldly from their bloody tongue. Yarrod only smirked, happy with such a sight, before noticing Wyman looking his way. Take the boy back to the yard, Wyman told the guards. Have Sir Lorak receive him. The men did as they were told, marching immediately with the beaten boy linked on their arms. Wyman did the same, heading back to the keep without offering even the slightest glance to Yarrod, leaving him alone in the kitchens. The footsteps around him had all grown quiet, and soon enough, silence was his only company.